Good evening. Uh, thanks for joining us on this Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, bonus points if, if you're tuning in to this during the game. Uh, I'm reminded of a story of a, of a man whose lifelong dream it was to attend a Super Bowl. And so he saved up and he scraped all his money. Finally, he was able to purchase one ticket, just one ticket. He couldn't take anyone with him. He, he just went by himself. And his seat was way up in the nosebleed section. So you barely see the, the field, but at least he was in the stadium. Well, while he was up there with his binoculars, he spied a seat that was right on the 50-yard line, an open seat, right on the 50-yard line, about 20 rows up. No one was sitting in it. And uh, he continued to watch that seat throughout the first quarter. And about midway through the second quarter, uh, he thought it was maybe safe to do some seat surfing and uh, go down and, and occupy that unoccupied seat. And so uh, he made his way down uh, through the stadium and uh, made it down to that unoccupied seat and uh, asked the man who was sitting next to that unoccupied seat if it was taken. The man said, no, it, it wasn't. And so uh, he sat down. He couldn't believe his luck. Here he was uh, with a much better seat than what he entered the stadium with. And he struck up a conversation with the man next to him. And the man explained that he actually owned uh, that particular seat, that he had bought uh, two tickets, one for himself and one for his wife. Uh, they had had a, a long-standing tradition of attending every Super Bowl, didn't matter who was playing or, or what the location was, but they had gone to every Super Bowl together. But he explained that lately his wife had been very, very sick. And uh, so the man who had taken this unoccupied seat asked the man, well, wasn't there someone else that you could bring with you, a, a friend or a family member? And, and the man said, no, uh, they're all at my wife's funeral. <laughs> so uh, some people would do just about anything to attend a Super Bowl. So it, it speaks really well of, of you if you are watching this tonight uh, during the, the big game. The lesson tonight applies to, to anyone who has problems. And I suspect that describes all of us. Uh, granted, there are some problems that are bigger and more urgent and more pressing than, than others, but all of us experience difficulties in, in life. There is something in your life right now that is giving you trouble. Job says in, in, uh, in the book of Job, uh, or it says in the book of Job, uh, yet a man is born to trouble as certainly as sparks fly upward. And so just like sparks fly upward, uh, trouble comes. That's just a, a regular occurrence in life. And as we look at, at the ancient text tonight, we're, we're going to, to see a few things. We're going to see first that things haven't changed much over the past several thousand years. Uh, some of the, the problems that are so common and afflictions that are so common today were experienced uh, back in ancient times and biblical times as well. And that might bring some measure of comfort, but it also brings comfort knowing that problems are not solely in your domain. You don't have or you don't experience all of the problems that are out there. And any problem that, that you've experienced has also been experienced by someone else. 
uh, or at least they've gone through something very similar to whatever it is that, that you're going through. Uh, have you ever had the experience of getting so overwhelmed by your troubles and, and your problems, but then you were really brought down to earth when you saw what someone else was experiencing, what someone else was going through? And you thought to yourself, I wouldn't trade, trade what I'm going through for what they're going through for any amount of money in the world. Uh, I had a very good friend in, in Chile who I uh, helped lead to Christ and, and baptized. His name was Raul. And almost as soon as he was baptized, as soon as he came to Christ, life started attacking. It was around that time that his wife left him. Uh, he was having to work hard to, to be reconciled to, to his son with whom he had a a strained relationship. He, he lost his job and, and went a year without any sustainable employment. And, and uh, he was competing with people much younger in, in the marketplace. So he's having trouble getting employment, finding a, a job. And as a friend, as a friend of his, I felt helpless in that situation. I, I'm a fixer. I want to fix people's problems and help them through. And he was coming to me for, for guidance and, and with counsel. And I felt so, so helpless. But God can help, and, and he speaks to us through Scripture about the problems and the difficulties that are so common to all of us that, that we encounter from, from time to time. And, and the wisdom of Proverbs that we're studying on Sunday nights addresses so many of these uh, problems. Uh, problems can often open doors of opportunity. And I remember we had a, a message on our marquee sign in front of the church uh, once that said, in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. Uh, sometimes that's where we find some of our best opportunities to, to minister to others and to help others and to grow in our relationship with God when we go through those, those difficult times. And so uh, what I want us to do tonight is, is look at some of the more common uh, problems and, and difficulties that we experience in life and, and see what God's Word has to say, and especially what the book of Proverbs has to say. And so one of the first very common problems is, is the problem of unrelenting trials. Uh, and here's a very important lesson for us to learn. Uh, even trials, even difficulties can often have redemptive purposes. I was talking to a friend recently and, and they were asking the question, what possible good can come from what it is that I'm going through? Because it didn't, it sure didn't seem like very much good could come out of what that person was experiencing. Notice a couple of verses from the Proverbs, though, with me as, as we begin tonight. First, uh, Proverbs chapter 17, verse 3. Here's what it says. The crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord test the heart. Look also now at, at Proverbs chapter 25, verse 4. Remove the dross from the silver. And a silversmith can produce a vessel. See, the only way that gold and silver know purity is because they are cleansed of their, of their dross. Uh, the impurities have to go before that gold, before that silver can, can know and, and have its full value. Uh, the New Testament also speaks to this. Uh, and so we're going to look at, as well as looking at the Proverbs, we're also going to look at some New Testament passages tonight. And, and this one comes from 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 6 and 7. In all this you are greatly rejoiced, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Sometimes we are put through the refiner's fire, and that's never a pleasant process. David says in, in Psalm 119, it, it was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. Boy, what a remarkable thing to say. One theologian said it this way, affliction is both medicine if we sin and preservation that we do not. And that's an important distinction that, that suffering, or it is an important distinction, that suffering doesn't necessarily come as a direct consequence of sin. Now, indirect, in a sense, because we live in this sin-sick, fallen world, and, and bad things happen because it's a, it's a sinful world. But just because you suffer doesn't mean that you're getting payback for something, some wrongdoing in your life, or for something, some mistake or sin 
that, that you've committed. That, that's what Job's friends, remember in the book of Job, they tried to convince him that his suffering was a consequence and result, direct result of the sin that was in his life. Jesus dealt with that in John chapter 9. Remember when the disciples encountered this man who, who was blind from the day that he was born. And so their question to Jesus was, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? And Jesus' response was, neither this man sinned nor his parents, but, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. And so suffering and affliction can, can bring about a redemptive purpose to, to bring God the glory and put us through the refiner's fire. Another problem in affliction is, is the problem of an unsettled home. Now, this was a problem thousands of years ago. It's still a problem today. Uh, whose responsibility is it? to bring about peace in the home. Well, I would submit that it's the responsibility of every family member. Now, Romans chapter 12 says, as much as it depends on you, be at peace with everyone. And uh, you refers to whoever's reading that text, whether it be father, mother, sister, brother, child, son, daughter. If you look at, at scripture, you see how every member of the family has the potential to, to throw a wrench into the machinery and every member of the family also has an opportunity to bring peace to a family. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4 puts the onus on fathers not to exasper exasperate the, their children. I remember the first time I encountered that verse uh, using that on my dad, <laughs> suggesting that, that maybe uh, the problem was his. And of course now that I'm more mature, or perhaps now that I'm more uh, experienced as, as a parent myself, I, I understand that that verse means that uh, not that a parent should never cross their child or that a parent should give the child everything they want, but it does mean that, that fathers should not sabotage the peace, pro uh, the peace process in their own homes. Uh, sometimes dads do have the culpability. Sometimes uh, dads are the ones that, that are creating the problem. Uh, wives and, and moms could sabotage the process as well. There's a, a proverb that always I, I get a kick out of in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 9, where it says, Better to live on the corner of a roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. And, and just that mental picture makes me laugh. I could almost imagine going through a neighborhood and seeing one of my neighbors up on the corner of his roof with a, you know, with a lawn chair, a newspaper, maybe a, a cup of coffee. And you ask your neighbor, what are you doing up there? And he says, oh, it's that wife of mine. I just can't get along with her. She's quarrelsome. She's argumentative. And it's just more peaceful here. Well, if a corner of a roof seems too extreme, Proverbs chapter 21, verse 19 says it this way, better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome, ill-tempered wife. Now, understand something, men. Uh, as men, we women don't have the, the corner on being argumentative and, and quarrelsome. Sometimes we can do some things that would cause our wives to be the ones that would want to move up onto the corner of a roof or move out into the desert. But again, the point is we all have a responsibility to bring peace in our homes and, and speak words, speak peaceable words. And, and children too. Children have that responsibility as well. In fact, I look at Proverbs chapter 19, verse 26. It, it says this, Proverbs 19, 26. Whoever robs their father and drives out their mother is a child who brings shame and disgrace. And we hear enough uh, statistics and anecdotes to, to know that, that the breakdown of the family is, is a major problem. It, it always has been. Uh, I suppose it always will be. I, I recently saw some statistics just in our own uh, area that the state of Arkansas has one of the higher divorce rates in, in the nation, and, and even more specifically in, in northwest Arkansas. And I don't know why that is, but, but you look around it, look around you, it probably doesn't surprise you. Uh, one of the passages that I often read when I'm doing uh, marital counseling or premarital counseling, one that I even read in the context of, of providing weddings or, or preaching wedding ser services and ceremonies is Ephesians chapter 5. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verses starting in verse 22. Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as you do to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. 
Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed it and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are all members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment of the promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. Now, sometimes we have subheadings in our Bible. Sometimes those are, are useful. Sometimes they're not. We have to remember that those subheadings uh, before sections of, of Scripture are, aren't inspired. Those were inspired. They were added uh, sometime later. Uh, some of your Bibles might even have a, a break between verse 21 and, and verse 22. And we didn't read verse 21, but I think it is crucial. It says this, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. See, we talk about who should submit to who. Should husbands, should wives submit to husbands? Should children submit to their parents? Verse 21 sets all of this up by saying that there should be a spirit of mutual submission in the home. That really the, the key for an unsettled home is that spirit of cooperation and sacrifice and, and mutual submission. That's really the only solution to the problem of, of an unsettled home. There's another common problem. That is the, the problem of insufficient funds. Anyone struggle with that one? There's just not enough month left at the end of your money. Proverbs chapter 27 verse 24 says, for riches do not endure forever, and a crown is not secure for all generations. Uh, one author described a conversation that he was having with, with a woman who was especially wealthy, and she was attempting, attempting to defend that. Not that it needed to be defended. It's, there's no sin, in, in, certainly, in being wealthy. But her statement, and she said this in all seriousness and with a straight face, she says, I don't want to be rich. All I want is to have everything that I want. I don't know about you, but it's, it's hard for me to see the difference in, in those two things. In another Old Testament wisdom book, Solomon wrote these words. Says, Whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit is there to the owner except to feast his eyes on them? That's actually from Ecclesiastes. Sometimes the problem isn't so much insufficient funds as it is that we think that our funds are insufficient because we don't have all that we want. And over and over again, the Bible calls us to commitment. Look at a rather familiar passage in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 12, 11 through 13. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned the secret to be content in each and every circumstance. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I could do everything through him who gives me strength. And so when our hearts are centered, rooted and centered in the grace of God, our priorities are completely reordered. We see God as the great resource. We see him as the great provider for our lives. But there's another problem that, that we all can relate to, and that is the problem of an uncertain or an unsettled tomorrow. Proverbs 27 verse 1 says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. James in the New Testament really expands on that thought. Notice what James says in, in James chapter 4 verses 13 through 17. Now, listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes and all such boasting is evil. If anyone, though, 
though knows the good that they ought to do and doesn't do it, for them it is sin. And so the Bible describes our life as just a mist, as, as a vapor that, that appears and then vanishes, that, that goes away as quickly as, it, as it's come. I just turned 49 years old uh, this week. Uh, some of you, from your perspective, that might be young. For others of you, you think that's, that sounds pretty ancient. But there was a time, well, not too long ago, when I didn't think too much about growing old. Of course, growing old that we know is so much greater than the alternative. But uncertainty rather than, than trouble should positively shape our, our attitudes. Let me, let me read you this quote from one of the books that I, I was reading this week. This thought ought to affect our attitudes. We ought to take the Lord into consideration and say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. A problem of life is to retain life, for death is so final to the physical. We are not able to plan and be certain that we have time to carry out all of those plans. And maybe the Lord will see fit to end our journey before we thought he would. All plans must take into consideration his desire for us. Now that's a lot of words in, the, in that quote, but, but let me tell you how Paul said it very concisely. He said, for me to live is Christ, to, to die is gain that the final outcome our future might be very uncertain but at least we can approach tomorrow with a sense of, of confidence and sense of purpose that it says whatever comes whatever comes my way my life belongs to god i don't know what what the future holds but I, I know who holds the future and maybe you're feeling right now overwhelmed by life's problems an unsettled home an uncertain future uh, insufficient funds wh whatever it is in, in your life but, but if there's one overriding message, and, and we see this in the Proverbs, and, and we see it throughout Scripture, God is in control, and, and God provides us uh, some wisdom that will help us navigate uh, those everyday challenges. Uh, God bless you. Thanks for joining us tonight. One step at a time, dear Savior, I cannot take any more. The flesh is so weak and whole.
Sing the 